Good morning and welcome to the Authority's annual public meeting. I'm Jess Turquette, Communications Advisor at the Authority, and I will be your MC for today's meeting. As you can all appreciate due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we are holding today's proceedings virtually as we did last year. This year, however, we will be doing things a little differently. This portion of the meeting, as well as remarks from Robert Poirier, Chair of the Authority's Board of Directors, Frank Denton, CEO, and Noah Gitterman, Registrar and General Counsel, have been pre-recorded to minimize the risk of technical disruptions. At the same time, we appreciate the importance of providing all of you the opportunity to engage with the Authority's leadership directly. So following these recorded messages, there will be a live question and answer period. I invite you to use the Zoom question and answer function to share your questions throughout today's proceedings. To pose a question, click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, type your question into the text box and click send. We will address as many of your questions as we can. If you experience any technical difficulties, you can let our team know by emailing info at rpra.ca and we will do our best to provide support. We have scheduled today's meeting for an hour and a half and we are expecting more than 100 participants online this morning. I now have the pleasure of introducing the Chair of the Authority's Board of Directors, Robert Poirier, who will provide an overview of our key activities from 2020. Good morning, everyone. Let me start by acknowledging how difficult the past year has been for all of us personally and professionally. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged us all, and I hope you and your family have all been able to remain safe and healthy. And to those who have been impacted more directly by the pandemic or have family or friends who have been, you have our sympathies. I want to express my appreciation to all of you for your continued interest in our work and for participating in today's proceedings despite these challenges. Our resilience as individuals and as a community will see us through this public health crisis and work together to build back a stronger Ontario. I would also like to acknowledge that we celebrate National Indigenous Day this month and are all on the traditional Indigenous territories across Ontario. I want to show my respect and honour all the Indigenous people who have been living on this land since time immemorial. The recent discovery of the remains of Indigenous children on residential school sites has shocked and saddened us tremendously. As we recite the land acknowledgement, we are aware of the importance of truth and reconciliation and ask us all to pause and reflect for a moment. Thank you. On behalf of the Authority's Board of Directors, the Executive Management Team and staff, I would also like to thank you for joining us today. As a regulatory authority of the Government of Ontario, we are all accountable to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, to the public and to the stakeholders, including all of you online with us this morning. Our annual public meeting, along with the annual report we published earlier this month, are two key public disclosure and accountability requirements and opportunities for the Authority. Your participation in today's meeting allows us to present our activities over the past year, address questions you may have about our finance and operations, and support both transparency and accountability for our activities. 2020 saw Ontario's legacy waste diversion programs for batteries and electronics wind up and transition to Ontario's producer responsibility regulatory framework, becoming the second and third materials to do so after tires. The battery recycling program operated by Stewardship Ontario was wound up on June 30th last year and transitioned to the new regulatory framework on July 1st. This was followed by the electronics recycling program operated by Ontario Electronic Stewardship, wind up at the end of last year and transitioned to the new regulatory framework on January 1st of this year. As many of you are involved in these processes know, winding up Ontario's legacy waste diversion programs and transitioning these materials to the new regulatory framework is a complex process indeed. We are appreciative of the collaborative partnerships between the Authority, industry funding organizations, waste management service providers, industry, municipal and provincial governments, and First Nations that have allowed these processes to occur with no disruptions in services to the public. This collaborative operating principle has guided our work and has been critical to the collective successes to date in changing the regulatory landscape for businesses. We recognize the regulatory changes come with legal, 
operational and financial challenges that stress business and municipalities, even while creating opportunities for growth and innovation. This is why in 2020, we focused efforts on minimizing regulatory burden, maintaining cost efficiencies in our operations, and supporting our restaurants in understanding and complying with new regulatory requirements. As you'll hear from Frank Denton, the Authority CEO, our financial performance demonstrates our success in operating cost effectively. And Noah Gitterman, our Registrar and General Counsel, will outline our successes in reducing regulatory burden and focus our compliance efforts and activities on supporting businesses through communications um, to comply with the new regulations. In 2020, we also began preparations to deliver digital reporting services beyond our original resource recovery mandate. The government passed legislation late to 2019 to expand the mandate of the authority to include digital reporting services for a wider range of waste and resource recovery programs beyond producer responsibility. The first two programs we have been directed to implement under this expedited mandate are the Hazardous Waste Program, known as HWP, and the Excess Soil Registry. These preparations saw both projects kick off the spring and we have seen great progress to date. These projects, like our producer responsibility initiatives, have also adopted our collaborative operating principle through the industry and ministry working groups that have been established to support these projects. This approach will ensure our digital reporting services will serve the needs of industry and the ministry and allow the authority to fulfill its mandated responsibilities. We are appreciative of the minister's confidence of the authority, ability to operate cost effectively while delivering uh, technology projects, working collaboratively with, collaboratively with stakeholders and supporting business and adapting to regulatory changes. With this changed mandate, our stakeholder universe has grown substantially, and this has given us pause to reflect on our approach of engaging stakeholders across the breadth of our programs. This led the board to begin a new practice of direct engagement with key stakeholders on financial issues by inviting uh, producer representatives to speak directly to the board on registry fees. This practice was strengthened with the minister's recent direction to establish an industry advisory council. We also continue to engage municipalities in the waste management sector through the Authority Service Provider Advisory Group. We look forward to building on our collaborative working relationship that we have established with our industry partners that, that has supported our accomplishments to date. I was honored to be elected chair of the Authority's Board of Directors last June and took on the challenge of the role because of my commitment to public service and my belief in the goals of Ontario's circular economy strategy. I'm indebted to Glenda Geese, the Authority's inaugural chair. Glenda led the establishment of the Authority and guided the organization through its first three years of operations, including the transition of tires to Ontario's producer responsibility regulatory framework. The success of the past year were achieved on the strong organizational foundations that she helped build. I would like to take a moment to thank Glenda for her contribution to Authority's successes in 2020. I would also like to thank David Brezer, who left the board um, when his appointment expired last November and his many contributions to the authority, including a chair of the audit committee. Over the last year, we welcomed four new members to our skilled base board, Christine Beaumain, Tanweer Galani Khan, and recently Jeffrey Steiner and Marnie Silver. I'm grateful for the support of the authority's board of directors who continue to guide the authority's work with commitment and strategic vision. The year ahead will be full of challenges as we continue to manage the impacts of the pandemic and navigate the regulatory changes underway in resource recovery. The recent release of the Blue Box regulations represents another major milestone in Ontario's ongoing journey towards a circular economy. The regulation lays out the future of the Blue Box program as the authority continues to oversee the wind-up of legacy Blue Box programs and transition it to the new producer responsibility regulatory framework. We will continue to work collaboratively with the ministry, industry, municipalities and First Nations to support this critical process to ensure this iconic program continues to benefit our environment and economy. We are also in the final stages of winding up the remaining part of the Municipal Hazardous and Special Waste Program known as MHSW. 
and transitioning it through um, the new regulatory framework and the new hazardous and special products regulation. I am confident that the authority staff and leadership team under Frank's leadership will continue to achieve excellence in fulfilling the authority's mandate to advance Ontario's circular economy. I would also like to end my remarks by acknowledging the Honourable David Puccini, Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. We look forward to supporting Minister Puccini in his newly appointed role and working together to advance Ontario's circular economy and ensure environmental outcomes and economic growth that will benefit Ontarians now and far into the future. I also wish to thank uh, former Minister Jeff Urich for his tremendous leadership and support. Thank you. Frank Denton, the Authority CEO, will now provide an update on the Authority's financial and operational performance in 2020. Over to you, Frank. Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for our annual public meeting. I wish we could be meeting in person as we did in 28 and 2019, before we went virtual in 2020. I hope to see some of you in person soon. Nonetheless, I am pleased about how well we're all continuing to adapt and harness technology to meet our objectives. Last year was our fourth year of operations since we were established in November 2016. And as you can see, if you've reviewed our annual report, there is quite a bit to update you on. Let me start by acknowledging the impact the pandemic has taken on the communities and businesses we serve. The collective resilience and ingenuity of all of our organizations has been remarkable. At the authority, like every business and organization in Toronto and across the world, we had to adapt to the new context. Although in-person activities remain suspended through 2020 and still are today, we have been able to continue assisting our registrants in complying with regulatory requirements. We connected and collaborated electronically, engaging and consulting stakeholders. By account of the number of consultations in 2020, we engaged more than in the previous year. We consulted on the residual funds for the municipal hazardous or special waste program in January. We consulted again on that program in June of last year. We also consulted virtually on registry fees during the summer and on the Blue Box wind-up plan throughout the fall. In response to the uncertainties businesses were facing because of the pandemic, we sought opportunities to reduce regulatory burden wherever we could. We allowed tire producers extra time to submit tire supply and performance reports. We allowed electronics and battery producers extra time to register under the new regulations. When setting our 2020 registry fees, we heard the feedback and we set the fees in a way that would reduce barriers to market entry and administer the burden. We did that by removing the fee for producer responsibility organizations and structuring fees to ensure fairness for small producers. As an administrative authority of the Government of Ontario, we operate on a cost recovery basis for fees charged to regulated businesses. Currently, we charge those fees to producers. This obliges us to operate as cost effectively as possible while ensuring that we have sufficient resources to fulfill our legislative mandate. We strive to achieve this balance in our budgeting and in our spending decisions. Looking at our 2020 balance sheet, you can see we ended the year with total expenses of 8.9 million. That was an increase of 18% from our total expenses of 7.5 million in 2019. However, our 2020 business plan anticipated expenses would be 11.5 million, meaning we're able to reduce our anticipated expenses by almost 23%. This was for a combination of reasons. By operating efficiently, remaining focused on our core mandate, delays in registry projects due to delays in the finalization of regulations, reduced expenses associated with in-person meetings due to COVID-19 public health restrictions, lower interest rates, and reduced board expenses. As my chair Robert noted earlier, the authority had a busy year in 2020. We implemented two new regulations, one for batteries, one for electronics. We also get, began preparations to fulfill our broadened mandate to develop digital reporting services for the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks Hazardous Waste Program and the new Excess Soil Registry. All this required us to increase staffing and spending on information technology. As you can see in our 2020 financial statements, our two key expense drivers are for human resources and for the registry. Our salary and benefits expenses in 2020 were 4.5 million, a 28% increase from 3.5 million in 2019. 
This reflects an increase in full-time equivalents from 27 in 2019 to 33.7 in 2020. And that was primarily in the areas of compliance and IT. Our registry expenses in 2020 was $1 million. That was flat in 2019. At the end of 2020, the authority has spent $7.2 million on the registry, including $2.1 million on the tires registry portal. The cost of the registry portal for batteries and electronics will be known next year when the system build-out is completed and the final cost is determined. Our financial statements show a direct correlation between our budget and our legislative mandate. As that mandate is set out in regulations the government makes and in minister's directions we receive from the minister. As a regulator, our focus is on fulfilling our mission to support registrants in complying with the regulatory requirements in order to maintain a level playing field for all businesses. In order to ensure those outcomes, the authority requires smart, committed staff and a registry system that can meet the specific requirements laid out in the regulations. I encourage all of you to review our annual report to learn how the authority's investments are supporting Ontario's strategy for a cleaner and more prosperous future. As the pandemic continues into a second year and businesses continue to face ongoing challenges, we will continue to explore how we can operate flexibly and cost effectively while ensuring that we have the people and the financial resources to fully deliver on our growing mandate. We'll seek to minimize both financial and administrative burden on businesses and support businesses in meeting their obligations during these difficult times. And we'll continue to engage and consult with stakeholders, both informally and formally. We welcome and value the perspectives of our partners, industry, and all levels of government. Listening to your views helps us in our business planning and helps us in our operational delivery. I'm grateful for the hard work, commitment, and ingenuity of my colleagues on the authorities team as we continue to implement the government's vision to transform resource recovery in Ontario. In particular, I'd like to thank colleagues who made important contributions in 2020 and have since moved on to other endeavors. Pat Moran, Jeff Rathbone, Tessa Blandaren, and Maria Constantinou were all instrumental in our 2020 delivery successes. I'm also grateful for the collaborative relationship we enjoy with staff at the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks uh, and for the support of the minister. I'm also very grateful for the support and guidance of the board of directors. 2021 is the authority's busiest year to date, with multiple registry projects underway for batteries, electronics, excess soils, and the hazardous and industrial liquid waste. We continue to oversee the liquidation of Ontario Electronic Stewardship and Ontario Tire Stewardship. On June 3rd, the government released the final regulation to transition Ontario's legacy resource recovery programs to the new full producer responsibility framework. The Blue Box regulation is going to bring major changes to how Ontario's much loved Blue Box program is delivered across the province. The new regulation will expand Blue Box collections to all communities outside the far north by 2026 will standardize what can be recycled and accept common single-use products, making recycling easier for Ontarians. I look forward to leading the team that will be providing essential support to enable this transition over the next few years. The government's created an ambitious agenda for the authority. We've been tasked to undertake many things to achieve the government's circular economy strategy. We're encouraged by the outcomes of the government's strategy. We've already seen tires, batteries, and electronics regulations since they've transitioned. A few examples. We've seen the successful wind-up of the tires, batteries, and electronics waste diversion programs transition to the new regulatory framework with no service delivery disruptions to the public. Under all three regulations, we've seen multiple pros providing resource recovery services in a competitive market. The authority's compliance team continues to successfully implement its strategy to bring free riders into compliance. And we're seeing the introduction of innovative technologies in resource recovery and processing sectors since the new regulations have come into effect. Success can only be achieved collaboratively, and we look forward to working closely with all of you in the coming year. Thank you. Now, Noah Gediman, our Registrar and General Counsel, will provide highlights of our compliance work. 2020. Good morning, everyone. My colleagues Robert and Frank have outlined the authority's primary initiatives in 2020, 
So my remarks will focus on the activities of the compliance and registry team. Despite the difficult circumstances of the past year, we developed compliance programs for two new regulations. The batteries regulation was uh, issued last February, just three weeks before Ontario declared a state of emergency and our staff transitioned to working from home. And the electronics regulation was issued last September when the province was experiencing pandemic second wave. Implementing a new compliance program can be challenging at the best of times. So I'm very grateful for the combined efforts of the authority team, the regulated community, and our partners in the ministry. Every part of the authority played an important role in transitioning batteries and electronics to the new producer responsibility regulatory framework. Our transition team conducted research and analysis to increase our understanding of the market, to align our compliance strategy to business practices. Our communications and stakeholder relations team developed a stakeholder engagement and education strategy to prepare businesses to meet their new obligations under the regulations. Our IT department and our finance and administration team developed a registration and reporting process to accommodate the tight registration deadlines for year one of both of those regulations. At the same time, they executed a strategy to develop the online registries for future reporting years. And our compliance and registry officers connected individually with over 1,000 potential registrants to build awareness and understanding of the new rules. The team also implemented a strategy to address free riders, resulting in the identification of 15 companies, including a major online retailer that agreed to pay $700,000 in owed fees to Stewardship Ontario. The compliance team undertook a number of inspection and communication initiatives to support a level playing field for all market participants across our programs. An underlying approach to our work is the principle of communi communicating for compliance, using communication tools proactively to support registrants in understanding and complying with the new rules. This strategy helps the authority deploy resources cost-effectively and on a risk basis. It also supports a collaborative partnership with the regulated community. The compliance team also continued its oversight of the tires regulation in 2020. At the end of 2020, Tires producers and their, uh, their producer responsibility organizations reported for the first time on their performance for 2019, the program's first year of operation. The collection target in the regulation uh, for large tires is set at 60% of the three-year average of reported supply. The collection target in the regulation for all other tires is set at 85% of the three-year average of reported supply. The program was over target for large tires with an 87% collection rate. It was under target for all other tires with a 73% collection rate. The compliance and registry team relies on a number of indicators to determine whether used tires continue to get collected at their end of life and their material recovered. The authority found no evidence that tires collected were not appropriately managed in 2019. Audited data submitted by registrants for 2019 show that um, a total of 148,000 tons of tires were collected, large tires and other tires, and a total of 126,000 tons were either reused, retreaded, or processed into other valuable materials. A key performance requirement in the tires regulation is that 85% of tires collected must be recovered. And based on uh, uh, this data, the 85% recovery rate was exceeded with 86% of the weight of all collected tires reused, retreaded, or processed into other material. The batteries regulation requires producers to begin performance reporting next year for the July 2020 to December 2021 period. And similarly, the electronics regulation requires ITT AV producers to begin reporting, uh, to begin performance reporting next year uh, for the 2021 period. While implementing the tires, batteries, and electronics regulations, we continue to monitor the performance of ongoing waste diversion programs operated by industry funding organizations. 
the overall amount of waste collected and diverted under the legacy programs has generally shown decreases across all material categories. The Blue Box program recycled approximately 730,000 tons and achieved a 57.3% recycling rate compared to about 780,000 tons the year before, a 6.9% decrease from the previous year. This was the first year the program failed to meet the 60% diversion rate target set by the Ontario government. The MHSW program collected approximately 27,000 tons compared to about 30,000 tons the previous year, decrease of 13%. And the electronics program collected about 43,000 tons compared to approximately 48,000 tons the previous year, a decrease of 11.7%. The reasons for these declines vary from program to program. For example, in the Blue Box program, the decrease is associated with a reduction in printed news and other publications caused by a move to digital platforms as well as lighter weight packaging. In electronics, the decrease is attributed to the use of lighter materials and smaller and integrated devices. While Ontario's legacy waste diversion programs have been successful in diverting millions of tons from landfills over time, more can be done. The new producer responsibility regulatory framework is transforming resource recovery in Ontario by setting enforceable targets in regulation, giving producers more choice in how they manage resources and creating more opportunities for innovation. As Frank discussed in his remarks, the compliance and registry team, along with the rest of the organization, is operating at a very high tempo to fulfill the authority's mandate. We are currently completing the batteries and electronics registry portals, administering the third year of the tires program, administering the first full performance periods for batteries and electronics, implementing the new blue box regulation, implementing the new hazardous and special products regulation, and developing two new digital reporting services, one for the hazardous waste program and one for the excess soil program. I would like to end my remarks by thanking Deputy Registrar Mary Cummins and all of the compliance and registry officers for their work over the past year. They have taken a smart, practical, and flexible approach to operationalizing the tires, batteries, and electronics regulations. And their commitment to working with and supporting our registrants has built a collaborative partnership that has been successful in transitioning three legacy waste diversion programs so far to Ontario's new producer responsibility regulatory framework. There is much more to do, including implementing the new blue box and hazardous and special products regulations. I am confident the compliance and registry teams communications focused and risk based approach to regulating will help achieve successful transitions of these final two legacy waste diversion programs. Thank you again for attending our annual public meeting. At this time, I'd like to open up the live question and answer portion of the annual public meeting. We already have a few questions in the queue, but as a reminder to, to pose a question, you can click on the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen and type your question with the text box and click send. We will do our best to answer all your questions. If Frank, Noah, or Robert do not have the answer readily available, or if your question is specific to your situation, we will follow up with you after the meeting. And likewise, if we don't get to all of the questions today during the session, we will follow up with you directly after the meeting. So I'll go to our first questions here. Um, this one is for Noah. Currently, processors and service providers in the e-waste sector are collecting and processing more material than they are able to, to contract for with producers and pros. This places the financial burden of recycling on processors rather than producers and is ultimately unsustainable. How does RPRA plan to manage this ongoing imbalance in the e-program and ensure producers meet their obligations for material that is collected? Uh, thank, thanks for that uh, question, Mike. We, the authority is, a, is a aware that some electronics processors are facing challenges um, obtaining sufficient supply of used electronics to sustain their operations. Um, and we're engaged directly uh, with um, uh, some of these uh, processors and other service providers uh, to uh, better understand the issues they are facing. 
We are also engaged directly with producers and their pros who are obligated under the regulation to help ensure that a compliance, uh, sorry, a compliant collection and management system is uh, operational in the first year of the program. A, a key focus uh, in the transition year for uh, our waste diversion programs is uh, making sure that uh, a compliant collection and management system, so a collection system that uh, meets the accessibility requirements and the regulation, um, and a management system that ensures that things uh, that uh, use material that is getting collected ends up getting managed uh, is in place. And, um, um, uh, and uh, that's what we're focused on right now with producers and, and, um, and their pros. A new system uh, under the reg does mean a change from the old model. So there uh, may be different sites, different commercial arrangements uh, under the electronics reg as opposed to what was uh, set up under OES. And we encourage individual uh, processors, service providers to continue to reach out to RIPRA individually uh, again so we can better understand their issues and um, uh, that will also help us monitor what's happening in the market and be able to uh, 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 push uh, producers and pros into compliance more efficiently. Thanks, Matt. Next question here for Frank. The Waste Free Ontario plan calls for a 30% diversion of waste to landfill by 2021 and implementation of disposal bans for materials in existing diversion programs. What is RPRA's role in advising the ministry on these two goals? Is the diversion target part of RPRA's goals? Thanks for that question, Sheila. We play an, uh, an important role in advising the ministry on the uh, outcomes and impacts of the policies that they implement. And certainly the environmental outcomes are, are, are first and foremost. Uh, we have, a, through our compliance efforts, through uh, data and market information that Noah and his team received, we're, we're able to provide uh, insights to the ministry and the, and the minister to support uh, decision-making and, and help them understand how Ontario is, is progressing towards those, uh, those targets. The, the, the target you mentioned in the Waste for Ontario plan, that's not a specific target in our in our published business plan or um, or report on in our annual report uh, but uh, all of the work that we do is with an eye to the outcomes and objectives that uh, the government's uh, reforms are intended to achieve. Thanks Frank. Um, this is another question for you Frank. There are growing concerns that RPRA is not properly resourced for the amount of initiatives it is taking on. How is RPRA assessing its needs and comparing itself to other compliance organizations? Uh, so we're putting a lot of focus now over the summer on assessing our needs for 2022. We'll be publishing our 2022 business plan uh, in October, following consultation with, uh, with some of the people on this call for our advisory council and advisory group. Um, we, each year, we assess our needs based on known information over the previous summer. So, and each year, there are significant unknowns uh, about what's going to be happening. We start the business process in May, and we're trying to, we're trying to forecast what we're going to need to spend in the following year. Um, uh, we have uh, when information changes, uh, <clears throat> we go back to the board uh, with adjustments to our budget. Uh, we have to date uh, been successful in setting budgets that are sufficient to meet uh, our the, need, the, the what we need to deliver. Um, and uh, we've actually come in under budget every year for, for a number of reasons. Uh, it's you know, my concern is I don't want to I don't want to overspend and I don't want to underspend. Uh, and we're operating in a very dynamic environment, particularly in 2020, when with so many programs being implemented, uh, so many projects underway. Um, it, 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 we're, 
we're tight. We're working really, really hard. I, I have to admit it. Uh, and we may have to do a little bit of right sizing uh, in the coming months. But to overall, I would say we're, we're reasonably resourced to, uh, to reasonably meet the expectations of the government and our stakeholders. Um, and uh, we're, that will remain top of mind. We, we, we haven't spent a, a lot of time comparing what we do to other compliance organizations because it's hard to find an apples to apples comparison. We're focused on what we need to do on our unique legislation and our unique mandate. Um, from time, we certainly talk to other organizations, but we really do it through our own um, internal business planning to determine what our needs are to meet the minister's objectives. Question for Noah. RPRA's annual report notes compliance efforts it undertook related to visible fees and the tires regulation. Given the issues that occur with visible fees in household hazardous products, visible fees have been an area of concern for many, including municipal governments. Can RPRA provide more information on its compliance efforts? One, what were the main issues identified? And two, how widespread were these issues and whether they have been rectified? Sure. Um, well, our, our compliance efforts with respect to visible fees, you know, start with the requirements that are in uh, the regulations we're implementing. So in the tires program, there are specific obligations around visible fees, uh, including uh, specific language uh, uh, and information that has to be provided to the consumer when a fee is charged. Um, and then a reporting and auditing requirement uh, to ensure that the fee that is being charged um, reflects the actual cost of recycling the product. So with respect to uh, the tires regulation, our work around visible fees, uh, it involved uh, responding to complaints that we received ab um, uh, about um, uh, visible fees being charged without uh, the proper uh, or the required information being provided to the consumer at the same time. Um, and our compliance work also involved proactive outreach by our compliance team uh, spot checks to ensure that, or to help ensure that um, uh, 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 producers or retailers who were charging a visible fee were meeting the compliance uh, obligations in the regulation. Uh, our visible fee related activities uh, under our other programs will depend on what the compliance obligations are in those regulatory frameworks. So for uh, in the, uh, uh, so for example, in the batteries and electronics programs we're operating right now, there are no specific rules around visible fees. Um, our uh, role um, with respect to visible fees uh, for those programs has really been responding to uh, uh, consumer questions uh, about fees um, and providing information uh, just to help them understand uh, what they're seeing and where they can go if they have questions about it. Thanks, Noah. There's another compliance-related question for you. Does RPRA plan to provide more details on their compliance efforts on a more frequent basis? For example, quarterly. Um, for example, the number and type of compliance cases open at the start of a period, open during a period, and close during the period by type. This information is helpful for stakeholders to understand potential issues, the functioning of the organization, and whether it is properly resourced. Yeah, thanks for raising that question. So, so uh, right now, we report on our compliance and uh, enforcement activities in our annual report. Um, um, and um, uh, you can uh, see an example of that in uh, the report, the 2020 report that we just published earlier this month. Um, we are uh, uh, regular, regularly reviewing how we... Uh, uh, communicate about our compliance and enforcement activities um, in, an, in a way that is uh, practical and manageable, that um, still preserves the integrity of the compliance function, um, and uh, um, 
um, provides helpful information to market participants. And uh, we're considering whether there are a, there is additional reporting we can do uh, apart from or outside of our formal annual report process. And uh, we'll be continuing to uh, 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 talk to and consult with stakeholders um, as we uh, review that, uh, that process and that set of activities. Great. Um, let's say another question for Noah. As stewards under the new HSP regulation have until December 31st, 2022 to roll out programs for municipality, for will municipalities that continue to accept such targeted materials between now and December 31st be reimbursed, compensated for all applicable costs that they have incurred? Um, i.e. HHW depots through that period? So that is a good question. My suggestion is that um, um, because that involves um, uh, more detailed operational questions about how the HSP regulation is going to be implemented, um, that uh, we can set up uh, uh, a separate conversation with the compliance team to work through some of those questions. And so we can be in touch, uh, I think just after the meeting to try to set that up. Yes, they, we can reach out to you directly to um, just to speak about this in more detail. Um, a question here for, for Noah. Um, can RPRA explain how it will address compliance when targets have not been met by producers as was the case with passenger tires? Yes. So um, uh, uh, the, sh the short answer there is um, it depends. It depends on the program and it depends on um, uh, um, uh, 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 what we're seeing in the, in the market and whether we're seeing evidence of disruption in collection and management or evidence that um, there are used, uh, there is used material um, that is uh, getting left out or not getting collected when it should be. Um, so the amount of tires collected, for example, depends on a number of factors, including, you know, what's supplied into the market, consumer behavior, uh, as well as the operation of the collection system. Um, we rely on a number of indicators to determine whether used tires are being appropriately collected. Uh, so starting with making sure that a compliant collection system covering the province as required in the regulation is set up. And so that, um, you know, includes, you know, our, our work in monitoring that system, analyzing uh, the processor data we get, engaging with pros, uh, liaising with uh, uh, the ministry, um, assessing public complaints, um, looking at historical collection and performance data, and also partnering with municipalities to make sure we're responding uh, to reports of discarded or stranded tires. Um, um, we, from a compliance perspective, um, you know, we don't discuss uh, uh, individual compliance cases, but I, I can say that we, uh, the compliance approach we take is risk-based and progressive and also accounts for the fact that uh, the regulated community does, uh, does need to adjust to a new regulatory program. Um, and a key focus of our compliance activity, uh, just like I mentioned with um, the electronics uh, programs being implemented now is trying to is is ensuring that a compliant collection and management system is being operated by the producers, um, and uh, that when we do get reports that tires are not being collected or there is a disruption um, between uh, collection and hauling to uh, processing or retreading, that we take action. And so, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we did take uh, 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 immediate action to address reports that uh, there were there was disruption in the system, 
and made sure that that disruption uh, got resolved. Now, uh, um, another question for you. Um, real challenges exist related to the exclusion of downtown business improvement areas from the new blue box reg, especially as both commercial and residential um, overplace their blue box material um, curbside in the same manner. OBIAA identifies over 100,000 businesses across Ontario, and these challenges exist for many municipalities. Has RPRA been assessing these challenges? And if so, with whom, um, CFIB or I OBIAA? Inclusion of these downtown business improvement areas or, or commercial spaces um, and targeted collection would benefit many. So I, I, I think that's really a question um, uh, for the ministry, uh, a policy question for the ministry about how they've set up uh, the regulatory framework in the new blue box regulation. So I would encourage you to uh, 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 reach out to the ministry with uh, 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 questions like that. Um, if it's possible that I'm not understanding it quite right and that there is sort of an operational question here about how RIPRA will be implementing the existing reg, and if that's the case, um, it uh, will probably be uh, more productive for us, again, to set up a, a separate co uh, conversation uh, with you and our compliance team uh, to uh, work through the issue. Yes, I will flag this question and can follow up with this individual. Um, this question here, um, again for Noah, do you plan to introduce e-manifesting in 2022? So I think that's asking about the um, hazardous waste digital reporting service that we've been directed to establish by the minister, which will involve an, uh, an e-manifesting component. Uh, that is being targeted to um, uh, get introduced on January 1st, 2023. So we are, we are currently in the process of um, uh, uh, working with uh, the ministry, um, with industry stakeholders, and with our technical vendors to um, set up a... Um, uh, set up that digital reporting service, uh, uh, which includes uh, both uh, reporting from generators about their on-site activities as well as the e-manifesting. And so all of that is in uh, process right now. Uh, and the go live date for that is January 1st, 2023. Thanks, Noah. This question here um, is regarding, I believe it's regarding Blue Box. Um, the RPRA initiative that is seeking individual municipal details, i.e. individual collection sites, addresses, and existing contracted services, um, as in collection and processing costs, is raising serious confidentiality issues among municipalities. Can you advise as per measures being implemented to alleviate these challenges? So I can, I can say that when we collect information, uh, we're always um, operating under our access and privacy code, uh, which ensures that um, uh, consistent with our statutory obligations that um, uh, commercially sensitive information will be protected. Um, uh, we are working uh, directly with um, uh, 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 municipal representatives uh, and municipalities uh, to work out uh, exactly what information and in what form uh, will uh, be collected um, and how it will be used under the regulation. Um, so if you have specific concerns, um, I encourage you to reach out to municipal representatives that um, uh, we're already working with or reach out to us directly um, um, and uh, uh, 
let us know what those issues are. Um, and another question here, um, again, it might be best for Noah, but again, might be better for follow up afterwards. Um, not clear if shelters and infrastructure under Ontario Housing Corp, um, which is privately owned, are included in applicable collection areas that will be serviced by the pros um, under and funded under full EPR. Can you confirm if they are in or out? Yeah, so that's um, uh, that's a great sort of implementation operational question um, that uh, is best funneled through our compliance team. Great. And Jess, I, I, I noticed there aren't any questions on the list. I'm, I kind of want to circle back to the first question I, I got from um, um, Mike Chopowick. And when I was answering uh, when I was answering Mike's question, in my mind, I was thinking of um, um, uh, issues that have been raised about insufficient material being pushed through the electronic system, which is one set of issues we've been dealing with. Um, but uh, we have also been hearing, like Mike asked in, in his question, that uh, processors are collecting and processing right now more than uh, uh, what they're able to contract for with producers, uh, maybe more than what producers and pros uh, might be obligated for. So we are working directly with processors and other service providers on that issue. Um, and again, we encourage um, uh, uh, processors and other registrants to um, uh, reach out to us directly um, um, so we can better understand what they're facing and uh, help us gather information that will make our compliance efforts with the producers and the pros more efficient. Thanks, Noah. So I believe that's all the questions that we have. And if that's it for this morning, um, then I'd like to formally end today's proceedings. So thank you to all um, who submitted questions today and for all of you for participating. Um, please contact us if you have any follow-up questions or comments that you'd like to share. And you can do that um, by emailing info at rpra.ca. Or if you have specific questions um, related to your regulatory requirements, um, feel free to email registry at rpra.ca. So um, as mentioned earlier, this video recording um, will be available on our website early next week. So thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to continuing our collaboration and partnership with all of you over the rest of the year. Thank you.